Thank you, Annie. Good morning. In keeping with, I'll say, the uh, the history and the theme, and everyone knows about men's retreat, how things aren't nearly as well organized as ladies' retreat, I have no idea exactly when it is, but I know I will be there because I'll be speaking. Um, but you should also register for that, too, if you're interested. And Mike, I'm sure, knows when that is because he is organizing it. Um, all right. So uh, if you have a Bible with you this morning, I guess... We're going to read a verse in a moment in James chapter 1, so you could flip there if you like. Um, while you're turning there, I was asked to, to share a very brief uh, overview of Christianity Explored that was mentioned starting up again this evening. So about a year and a half ago, uh, we sent out, we being Read of You Bible Chapel, 5,000 flyers in the community, inviting people to come in and uh, watch a video and, and have some time of Q&A once a week. And here we are uh, a year and a half later and uh, still going. And so every week it's open to everyone, uh, whether you know nothing about God. Some people that come have walked with God for decades. Uh, we, we watch 15 minutes of a, a video and then we get together in the back and just chat and, and ask questions. It's intended to be very informal. And so if you have any interest in, uh, in that or just wish you could sit with someone and ask questions about God, his word, and so on. Uh, that's what it is. Uh, it's welcome to come come when you can, leave when you must, 6.30s Sunday evenings. And if you are interested, uh, yeah, we'll be starting up tonight. We can get your email and uh, keep you informed on that. So as Rennie alluded to, the topic this morning that I, I have before us, and uh, some of you who are at camp this summer uh, maybe heard some of this already, but are thinking about God's anger, God's anger, God's wrath. It's one of, I'll say, the most common criticisms you will find if you start perusing the internet or talking to people. They'll say, well, you know, I, I couldn't follow or, or obey or worship the God of the Bible because he is an angry God. Or maybe they'll say, well, in the Old Testament, I, I can't come to grips with how he's always angry. In the New Testament, it's love and anger in the Old. And, and how does this all fit together? And they tend to just want to throw out the whole thing because it doesn't make sense. Because who wants to deal with someone who's angry all the time? Well... Is that a fair criticism? Is it true? Does God get angry? Does God show wrath? Uh, how do we respond to something like that? So that's kind of my intention of, of this topic here today. Not that we would just say, well, no, no, God doesn't get angry and run away from the topic. No, God's bigger than any question we could ask. And he speaks to a lot of these things in his words. So we're going to spend some time talking about it today so that we would understand and hopefully have a better understanding, <clears throat> if not already, of what God's anger and wrath, what they are, why they happen, uh, and how they relate to us on a daily basis. So before we get into that specifically, I'll say we should probably define what we mean by anger. So dictionary definition, a strong feeling of annoyance or displeasure. I'm sure all of us know what anger is, and we've experienced that emotion, uh, but maybe it's one of those ones where it's a bit hard to put into words. A strong feeling of annoyance or displeasure. I can understand that. Wrath, then, would be to another degree. Extreme anger is the dictionary definition. So all of that annoyance and displeasure to another level. Uh, other terms sometimes you might use uh, losing control or losing one's temper. Uh, well, you have an outburst, you're angry, you lose control. We, we probably all can relate to that. And I'll, I'll share you a brief story um, that maybe illustrates that a bit better to get us warmed up here. So last summer... Unfortunately, uh, Rachel's grandmother had passed away, and we had planned to go to Toronto that weekend, and she was in northern Ontario in Sturgeon Falls. So we said, okay, well, we'll figure it out. We'll put the kids in the car. We'll head up to the funeral, and then we'll make our way back down to Toronto. So it was Rachel's family. So I thought, well, we'll bring the kids, Reed and Lydia. And Lydia is usually able to keep things together pretty well. Reed, it's a toss-up. So we planned for the best. So we had all the toys, and we thought, well, well, we'll be able to last through this funeral. It became very apparent a few minutes in. If, you, if you're a parent, you've been there, you know, you just got to know when to pull the parachute and get out. It was, wasn't going to work. wasn't meant to be. So I, I left Lydia with Rachel and I took Reed. Anyone ever been to Sturgeon Falls? All right. Shout out to Sturgeon Falls. There's not a whole lot there. Um, so I remember texting Rachel, like, I'm just driving around. We're looking for stuff to do with Reed. Like, is it done yet? No, we're into someone's sharing. And no, now my dad's sharing. And like two hours have passed. And we've seen every square inch there is to see of, of Sturgeon Falls. So finally... You can see my, my anxiety, my frustration is, is starting to creep up. We get through the day, we pack the kids in the car, a few more hours of driving, which is not helpful for that stress level. Uh, but we're making our way down to Toronto, and we, we stop in Aurelia, and I thought, hey, like, 
let's go into Boston pizza. The kids love pizza. Let's, let's kind of get things back together here. So that was a horrible decision in retrospect. Um, should have gone for a fast food option. We're sitting down there and Reed's just losing it. He's and like, I've, I'm getting, I've had it I'm kind of up to here. Finally, we're waiting for the food. The food comes, power goes out. Now I was sitting pitch, pitch black in this restaurant. Reed starts taking his shoes off and throwing them across the restaurant. And so I'm, I'm going across, you find the shoes. So sorry, like, thank you, bring them back. He grabbed the glasses off my face and threw them across the restaurant. This is where like the anger to wrath to like losing one's temper comes into it. Like if I, I like I felt like I could have choke slammed him through the table or something at that point. I was I was so not in a good position uh, mentally and so anyway we got through the day no physical injuries and uh, it's just my point of this silly little story is you can probably relate to times in your life where something happens and something else you're kind of keeping it together but you reach a boiling point where you just lose it you're like I can't take this anymore. Anger, wrath, losing one's temper. God gets angry. God has moments of wrath. God never loses his temper. God cannot lose control of anything in creation or also himself. So that's really important that we would understand that. So, uh, and sometimes when you see, so, and then is God's anger the same as our anger? Well, I asked you to turn a while ago to James one twenty and left you there. Sorry, we're just going to read that one verse. James 1 verse 20 says this, human anger does not produce the righteousness of God. Or perhaps your Bible has the wording a little different. Human anger does not produce the righteousness of God. So in other words, it is a little different, our anger and his anger. Um, God doesn't need our anger and our emotions of anger to carry out his purposes because often ours are tainted with sin, self-serving, motives, uh, we're just not comfortable, frustrated, whatever. And that, that's not what God's anger is about. So we can't just say, well, when I get angry, it's like when I read about God anger, it's the same thing. It's not. They're not the same thing. Um, so what is the opposite of anger? Well, perhaps you might say love. And this is another really important principle. So if you're taking notes, God gets angry. God has moments of wrath. God does not lose his temper. Very important. The other very important, God is love revealed to us in 1 John 4. God is love. God is not anger. God's anger is provoked. It is not inherent to his character. He is love. He always is love. His default is that he wants to love. Anger, in fact, he revealed himself to Moses with a long list of names in Exodus 34 after Moses, in a fit of anger, had destroyed the first set of tablets. Making another one, God revealed himself. He said, I am this, I am this, I am this. I am slow to anger. That is one of the names that God uses to describe himself. He does get angry, but that's not his default. His default is love. God is love. God is not anger. It is not part of his nature. So then why does God get angry? Well, we're going to look at a few examples here in a moment, but someone defined God's anger as this, and I really like this definition, uh, a measured and reasonable response to the intrusion of injustice and evil into his creation. The measured and reasonable response to the intrusion of injustice and evil into his creation. So it's not just like a preference. Some people might say, well, you know, like there is this sin, God's angry sin. Why doesn't he just not get angry? Why doesn't he just not have that reaction? Well, it's not his nature. And it's really hard to describe in human terms. I was trying to come up with ways that I could come up with an analogy in my life and how it would describe, well, he's God and I'm not. So we're not on the same plane. But one silly, perhaps simple example that I could relate to is I remember very vividly the moment that I decided that I would submit my life to Jesus Christ as my savior. A lumber of things changed in my life, but one of them was my tolerance of, we might say, inappropriate language. Like you hear words at work or at school or things like that. And Honestly, a lot of those words, they don't bother me. I don't use them, but they're there and they don't really, I'm, I'm indifferent to them. Someone taking the name of my Savior, the Lord Jesus, and using that as a curse word or something derogatory, honestly, it grates me. It is like nails on a chalkboard type thing. Like it just, I can't help but have a response to it. You say, well, why don't you just get over it? It's no big deal. Well, no, it's important to me. It's precious to me. And that is my response. So in some ways, when we say, well, why can't God just get over sin? Why can't he just not get angry? 
That tells us more about our desensitized nature towards sin than it does about God. You see, sin matters to God. We get so loose and used to sin that maybe it doesn't even bother us to that degree. Another example I was trying to think of, imagine a scene of a playground where, let's say, my children are playing. Something like the perfection of creation. It's beautiful. It's fun. It's supposed to be safe. Now, imagine there was a manhole cover beside the playground that someone had left off. And there was this big, large hole in the ground beside the play structure. If I were to discover that, my reaction, I'd be kind of angry. Why? Well, I didn't do it, but I'm angry because here's this beautiful scene that's supposed to be safe and happy and joy-filled. And this, this obstacle has intruded into the scene, and it's, it's caused for great danger, great collapse. So when God sees sin in the world, the world wasn't always this way. And so that's part of the reason why it bothers him. There's all these hazards that are there that we don't see what the outcome will be. We, we're happily playing on the play structure, and in a moment we could fall into that hole and cause great damage, destruction. God sees the outcome of sin, and that bothers him. And so that is one of the reasons why there's anger. Habakkuk 1.13 is a great verse. It says this, O God, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil. You cannot look on iniquity. Habakkuk 1.13, you are out of pure eyes than to behold evil, you cannot look on iniquity. So God does get angry with sin. Let's look at a couple examples of that now. Now, let's turn back to Exodus chapter 4. I picked out three examples, actually, of where God got angry, not at the quote-unquote bad guys, but got angry at his own people. So that we would see that this, this anger that God shows, and he does show. Let's not say that God doesn't get angry. He does. But he is slow to anger. And there is reasons for it. But I picked out three examples that we would look at of his own people. That there was anger or frustration that had happened. Because I would just want us to see that. It's not that there's favoritism here. God cannot tolerate sin, no matter who is committing it. Okay, Exodus chapter 3 and 4. So this is the scene of Moses uh, being called as an 80-year-old man, he's out in the uh, uh, wilderness of Midian, serving Jethro, his father-in-law, looking after the sheep. He sees the burning bush, and it is at this time that God calls him, you will be the one to return to Egypt to set my people free. And if you recall, Moses wasn't a fan of the idea. Um, just quickly hit there, he had five objections. Uh, chapter 3, verse 11, he said, well, who am I? He's not going to listen to me. Chapter three, thirteen. well, what shall I say? God tells him. Chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, they won't believe me. Okay, God deals with that. Verse, chapter 4, verse 10. He says, I'm not eloquent. I'm not a good speaker. God deals with that. And then my favorite of his objections is 4.13. He says, O oh Lord, send someone else. So it wasn't, even, it wasn't even just that he said, well, I can't do this. I said, actually, I'm just, I'm not doing it. With that... Exodus 4.14, 4, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is not Aaron the Levi your brother? I know he can speak. Behold, he will come out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad and so on. So he said, okay, I'll let Aaron do the speaking, but you're going. Guess what? From this moment on, there was no more objections. You see, sometimes anger can be instructive. Um, again, if you're a parent or you all have had parents at some point or someone you looked up to, there's a tone of voice that gets reserved for moments when we are serious. We're not messing around, and your kids or you understand that, okay, this isn't a game anymore. You may not necessarily associate that with anger, but I think Moses realized very quickly, okay, um, God's not messing around. There was no risk here of Moses being consumed with a firebolt from heaven or lightning or anything like that, but the anger was true. God said, I've dealt with this, 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 this. You're going to do it. And Moses got the message. Okay, next one I want to look at is Solomon. Uh, let's flip over to 1 Kings chapter 10. A little bit further ahead into your, uh, your Old Testament. So Solomon... Solomon was the king who followed David, who was the king who followed Saul. You recall the Israelites for a long time and their nation did not have a king. But God knew that one day they would want a king. And he made provision for them. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 17, 
Remember, Deuteronomy was the second law giving. That's where the, the De and the Deuteronomy comes from. This was as they were about to enter the promised land. Many of the people who had originally heard the law had passed on because they had died in the wilderness. And so God saw fit that, well, let's go over this all again. And he, he had some also commands looking forward. And one of them was in Deuteronomy 17, he said, there will be a day when you want a king. And the reaction was, well, no, we have, we have you. We don't need a king. God says, no, believe me, you're going to ask for a king one day. And when you do, he said that there's a few uh, constraints I want you to set around him in Deuteronomy 17. He shouldn't acquire horses, like don't multiply horses to himself, that he has this big, large army, because then he will trust the army and he will not trust me. Second thing, he said, don't take on lots of silver and gold and wealth. He'll trust that and not look to me. And finally, he said he shouldn't have many wives. Don't bring in foreign wives uh, from all these other lands because they will turn his heart away from the true and living God. Sounds pretty simple. Three or four requirements when you have a king. Okay. Well, we get into Solomon. So in 1 Kings 10, verse 18, we read, Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best gold. Down to verse 21. All of King Solomon's drinking vessels were gold. All the vessels of the house of the force of Lebanon were pure gold, not even silver. Nothing accounted of it in the days of Solomon. So his throne, gold. Everything he ate with, gold. Everything he drank with, gold. It sounds a bit unnecessary. And it's exactly what God said not to do. Don't multiply gold. Okay, well, there's one of the things. Well, there's a few other things. Hopefully he didn't do, do those too, right? Well, let's go down to verse 26. Solomon gathered together chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horsemen. He bestowed them in cities. Verse 28, Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt. That's exactly what God said not to do. He said, don't go back to Egypt. I brought you out of there. So again, God said, don't multiply horses to yourself. And that's exactly what he's doing, not that. He's adding up horses so he can have a big army. So the temptation is that he wouldn't trust God. Well, you remember the last thing was, don't marry women from foreign lands that don't worship the true and living God. They're going to turn away your heart. We go down to chapter 11, verse 1. What did he do? King Solomon loved many foreign women, together with the daughters of Pharaoh, the women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonites, Hittites, of all the nations concerning, down to verse 3. He had 700 wives, princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. It's almost unbelievable to read in the black and white of Scripture exactly the things that God said not to do a couple generations earlier, one by one by one came to pass in his life. And we see God's reaction to this in uh, verses 9 and 10 of chapter 11. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him. Now, just imagine what this scene would be like. Or imagine if you, in some way, if you could imagine what it would be like if you were God. Why did God say, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this? Is it because he didn't want him to have fun? Is it because he didn't want him to have a successful reign? He didn't want him to have all the best things in life. It had nothing to do with that. He did not want him to have the heartache of defeat, to be have his heart torn away from the true and living God, for the nation to fall apart. God didn't want all of those things to happen, and he knew that's what would happen if Solomon didn't listen, and he didn't listen. And so that's why God is angry, or God is frustrated, because of the devastation that is about to befall in the nation. Devastation because of disobedience. So God is angry when we disobey very plain commands that he gives to us in scripture, not so that we wouldn't have fun or an enjoyable life or any of those things, but rather he knows the outcome of them. He knows what happens if we fall into that manhole cover, that we end up hurt. And it's for that reason he was angry. He didn't want that to happen. He knew that's what was going to come. Okay, let's look at one more from the Old Testament. Flip back to 2 Samuel 6. We're going to consider God's anger against a man named Uzzah. So this is a time in the history of the nation where the Ark of the Covenant, the large box, picture almost the size of a casket type thing, uh, in which God had contained the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod that budded, and a jar of manna that they would remember. These amazing artifacts of the history of the nation contained and within the Ark of the Covenant, and it was supposed to be handled in a certain way. There was holes along the sides where he'd put in a staff, and only the high priests would be the ones who would pick up and carry the Ark to move 
as the tabernacle would move. Well, unfortunately, the children of Israel started to trust the ark more than God. They thought the box had some mystical significance. They brought it out to battle one day, and they lost it. It was taken away into a foreign land by the enemies of God, because it was never supposed to leave the temple tabernacle in the first place. Okay, it's finally coming back, and they're bringing it back home, and that's the day we find ourselves here in 2 Samuel 6. David gathered together all the chosen of Israel. 30,000 people were there to watch. David arose, went to all the people with them from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, who was in Gibeah, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which is in Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God, and Ahio went before and David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on their instruments made of fur and harps and psalteries and timbrels and cornets and cymbals. They came to the threshing floor. Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him dead there for his error, and he died beside the ark of God. And David was displeased so on. We'll, we'll stop there. Imagine if you were Ahio and Uzzah that day. It could have been either one of you, and this is how it was. Now, so what's the deal here? Like, imagine if you were there, the Ark of God, even if you don't really know what it is, you know this is a big deal, probably not good if this thing falls on the ground. And as the, the cows were, were oxen were carrying this cart along, uh, it stumbled and it was going to fall, and, and you knowing that's not a good thing, you tried to stabilize it because you're trying to respect it, right? But you're not allowed to touch it. God made that very clear in the law. Only the high priest, these two were not. And you don't touch it. The only way is on these stabs on the side. Doesn't it seem a bit unreasonable that God literally killed him on the spot? He meant well, right? Aren't his intentions worth something? Well, God cares more about obedience than our intentions. You see, there was a lot of mistakes that had happened to lead up to this point. One, the ark should have never been gone. It should have never left. So that was a problem in the first place. Second, it was always supposed to, like I said, be carried by high priests, staffs, just like any other uh, king of the time. You know those scenes where you see somebody like reclining, eating grapes, kind of, and big umbrellas, and somebody's carrying them in? That's how royalty is supposed to be brought into a town. And the ark represented God. And so that's why it was supposed to be carried. You know what carts and oxes were for? They were for farm implements. They were for things you would use for work not the most important object that they had. And so, yes, you say, well, this should work. This should be good enough, but it's not what God wanted. And on this day, with 30,000 witnesses, God had to make a very clear point that obedience matters. You might say in your life, well, you know, I know I'm supposed to do this, this, and this. I haven't done them, and nothing bad's happened, so therefore God must be okay with it. That is human logic and human reasoning. And what I'm here to tell you today is that is one of the reasons why God could get angry with us sometimes when we disregard the very plain commandments of his word. If you know you are disobeying him in some way right now, I would commend you, spend some time today and figure that out. It's not like you're going to be consumed with a firebolt from heaven tomorrow, but things could happen, right? Like I'm not in the position of God. My point is to point out to you it's a big deal. When he disobeyed, God, obedience matters to God. And he was angry because so many things got blown through. Finally, something had to happen. So three times where God's own people were on the wrong end of his anger. Now, how about New Testament examples? There's a few we could look at. One of them that perhaps comes to mind to you right away was in the temple. We're not going to read that one, but at the start of his ministry in Mark 2, sorry, John 2, and at the end of his ministry, Matthew 21, the Lord Jesus entered the temple and he found within there changers of money. And what were they doing? Well, to offer at the temple, if you wanted to give an offering, uh, that was very commendable. You would come from a far land, say, I'm here to offer to the Lord. And they say, well, that's great, but your, your money is filthy. It's dirty. It's polluted. You have to offer the temple currency. But lucky for you, we have a gentleman right here. He can help you out. He'll exchange your money. And guess what? It wasn't a very fair exchange. So people in the name of religion were taking advantage of people who honestly were seeking to worship God and do the right thing, and they were getting taken advantage of in God's house. So you can imagine why God would be frustrated with that. So twice the Lord Jesus entered in, turned over these tables, and the point of the twice is he did it once at the start. Three years later, he did it again. Nothing had changed. They didn't care. 
what he had. But it doesn't actually say in the, either of those passages that he was angry. There's only one time we read that he was angry, and we are going to read that one in Mark chapter 3. So in Mark chapter 3, Lord Jesus entered a synagogue. And he found there, chapter 3, verse 1, he found there there was a man who had a withered hand or, or some, some type of affliction on his hand. And they, that is uh, the Pharisees and others who would have been there, they watched him, people who were against Jesus, they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day. Because if you recall, the Sabbath was a day of rest. You were not to work. And they associated healing someone with great work. So they're looking at him. Is he going to heal him that they might accuse him? And Jesus said to the man who had the withered hand, stand up. He said to them, so he said to him, stand up. He says to them, he turns to the crowd now and he says, am I law allowed or is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Is it okay if I do something good on the Sabbath or to do evil, to save life or to kill? They had no answer for him. They held their peace. When he looked around about them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole, just like his other. You see, the Lord Jesus was angry here, because here was a group of people around who could not care one iota less about this man. Zero compassion. They saw him as an opportunity to accuse Jesus of doing something wrong, which wasn't wrong in the first place. You were allowed to do good on the Sabbath day. There was a lot of other tasks you weren't supposed to do, but he wasn't doing work here for him. This was nothing. He was healing a man. You would think they would be excited. Wow, brother, your hand is, is good again. Isn't this great? No, they were stirred up in a frenzy. That's why he was angry. He was angry with hypocrisy. He was angry with religion gone rogue. The whole point of where they were was to draw people to God, and they were pushing people further and further from God. If you're playing games with God, I don't know why you're here today, and I don't even personally know all of you who are here. I know many of you. I don't know why you're here, but if you are here because you feel it looks good to others, if you are here because you feel it's fulfilling some obligation, maybe you're here because someone dragged you here and you wish you weren't here. I don't know. But these people weren't there because they were seeking God. And it really, really bothered him. They were playing games with God. And God knows all of it. And that makes him angry. Okay, let's look one, one last example where the word itself is not used. But let's go ahead into Mark chapter 14. So we get now to the end of Jesus' life, or, or very close to it. We're on the very night in which he is about to be arrested. He's with his friends in a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. And in Mark chapter 14, he, he wants to pray. And he wants to pray on his own. And it says, verse 35, Mark chapter 14, verse 35, The Lord Jesus went forward a little, so he left his friends behind. He went off to pray by himself. He fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, that hour might pass from him. And he said, Father, Abba, Father, all things are possible to you. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Now, what cup is he referring to there? He, he doesn't have a physical cup. I know it's not obvious just from a reading of the passage. He's referring to something else. And if we were to read, we're not going to take time to turn back. A couple examples from the Old Testament. Jeremiah 25, 15 speaks of the cup of God filled with the wine of my wrath. Isaiah 51, 17, you have drunk from the cup of his wrath. So over and over again in the Old Testament, this image of the cup was associated with God's anger or wrath building up to a point where it was full. And so what the Lord Jesus is referring to here is he is looking ahead. No one else knows what's going to be, be coming to him in the next day. But he is about to be arrested, taken, literally crucified and nailed on a cross, physical suffering beyond anything that we have ever entered into, but that's not even happening. He's referring here to the cup of God's wrath. 
that will be poured out upon him. Now, why, why would God be so angry with Jesus? Jesus never did anything wrong. He was perfect in every way. He is angry because of my sin, because of your sin. You see, Jesus is my substitute. He is the one that stood in my place. So all of my sins that we've talked about, how sin bothers God. God is angry with sin. God is wrath with sin. He's angry with me because of those sins. But Jesus said, I will come down into the world. I will take that punishment for everyone. And so he's seeing the accumulated wrath for every sin that has ever been, is being, and ever will be committed. And he sees it in that moment. He says, Father, I wish there was some other way that I didn't have to go through this because suffering that wrath is going to be almost too much to bear. There was no other way that God could show his love to the world than that there had to be someone who would die. The wages, we read in Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. Well, what does that mean? Wages are good, right? You get paid, you go to go to work, you get wages at the end of every two weeks or, or whenever. Good stuff, right? Well, you get, in return for your work, you receive wages. Well, in return for our sin, we get death. And that's why there is death to come. And so someone had to die. It either has to be me for my sin, and I suffer the anger and wrath of God for my sins forever, or someone has to do it in my place. And so Jesus Christ did that. And that's why we read, let's go over to Romans chapter 3. A big word, and we're going to close with this verse and then with a story. Because everyone loves stories. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through redemption that is in Jesus Christ. So he could redeem us. Whom God has set forth, verse 25, to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, and so on. Now, depending on your translation, I know NIV nukes this word, and I, I do like the word. God has set forth to be a propitiation. I'll tell you why I like the word. When you read big words and you haven't a clue what they mean, it forces you to go figure it out. And then you dig into it and you learn something maybe. So propitiation, what are we talking about here? Well, what it means is not only was a payment made, God is no longer angry with their transaction. Let me try to illustrate it to you with a story. So let's imagine that uh, you had an errand to run and you said, I really need to get there in a hurry. I can't afford to take the bus. It's not enough time, whatever, taxi, Uber. Could I borrow your car? And I say, okay. Sounds good. I don't really know you that well, but trust the Lord. It's all going to be good. Here's the keys. You take my car and uh, you drive to go wherever you're going. On the way back, tragically, major accident. Now, thankfully, you're totally fine, but the car is done. Gonzo, right off. You come back to me and say, you know, I'm really, really sorry. Your car is gone. Like, there's nothing left. I'm okay. How, is, how am I reacting to that situation? Well, maybe on the outside, I'm kind of smiling a little bit. Oh, I'm glad you're okay. But really what I'm thinking about is my car. Like it's, it's gone. There's nothing left. And you say, well, you know what? I feel really bad. Here is, I don't know, pick some object of trivial value. Here is a pen. I'd like you to have this in exchange for the car. And you say, great. Like the value just, obviously it's silly. It doesn't even add up. It's not even close. But the point of this story is, let's say you say, well, how much was the car worth? I'm like, I don't know, 15 grand. Even if you were to write me out a check, 15,000 right there, and you hand it to me, am I happy? I'm still kind of angry. Because it's just, it's inconvenient, right? It's just, it's not good. So it's not just about paying the price that mattered. But imagine if there was some way that you could not only cover the price, but we get to a point where I honestly could say I'm no longer angry anymore. That is what Jesus Christ did for our sins when he died in our place. It could have simply been a business transaction. Okay, you committed this many sins. He paid for those sins. You're safe, but I never want to see your face again. That could have been God's reaction. The business transaction has happened, but he's still angry with me. But it's not like that. That is what propitiation means. The payment was made and God is no longer angry with us in Christ Jesus. So all of this anger that we've built up, God does get angry. God even gets wrathful sometimes. He never loses control. We established that, but he is angry because of sin. 
that anger, that wrath was filled up in, in a proverbial cup. And that wrath was poured out on Jesus Christ as he hung on a cross to die for my sins and yours. And he says today that if we trust by faith, simple trust in your heart that he did that for you, he says, I forgive you of your sins. The price is paid. Here's the check, 15,000, whatever. Payment is made for the sins and I'm no longer angry with you anymore. It doesn't mean that we'll never sin again. It doesn't mean that we're perfect. In fact, far from that. But we are forgiven because Jesus Christ has paid for those sins for me. That is the gift of God that he extended with us. So when we talk about God's anger and God's wrath, let's not say he doesn't get angry and wrathful because he does. Because sin bothers him. It's not simply a matter of preference. He is offended by sin. As you read in Habakkuk, he's a pure eyes and to behold evil and iniquity. He can't look on it. He can't. Just as if something may bother you and it's just the way you are. He cannot tolerate sin, but because of that, he sent his son that he would die in our place. Propitiation, God is no longer angry. And so Romans 8, 1, we will close with this. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No longer angry with our sins because of what our Savior did. Let's, uh, let's pray and ask God to help us remember what we need to from his word. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you most of all that you love us to such a degree that you would send your own son down into the world to dirty himself with the affairs of this life, to be ridiculed and suffer. And all of these things that I feel like I have never done for him, he did that for me. He took on my sins, every one that I've ever committed, every one that I ever will commit, so that I no longer am under the condemnation of God today. I am forgiven, not because I'm great, or even good, but because I choose to align with a perfect Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, awaken our hearts. If we realize today that we are in our sin, we too need to submit and trust Jesus Christ died in our place. Father, if we know we are willfully disobedient, we know how much that bothers you. We see it from your word, and so give us grace to overcome. You give us victory through Christ Jesus and the power of your spirit. Lord, help us to remember and hear what we need to today. You do get angry. But thank you, Lord, that you are love. Your nature is not anger. You are slow to anger. Give us grace that we would not provoke you to anger. We pray these things in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen.